Hey you guys, this is the Coupling Spire podcast. Here's a couple of things you might need to know or maybe you just forgot. I'm Taylor, a volunteer firefighter and also a firewife to my favorite firefighter. Join me as I talk anything and everything fire related. I don't claim to be an expert. I just love to talk fire and I'm not afraid to get into real and deep discussions. Everything I say is my own opinion and does not reflect the opinions of any agency or organization I am associated with. Let's get on with the episode. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of the Couplings Fire podcast. My name is Taylor Anderson. I am your host. I I run this little shindig here. Uh, It's been a lot of fun so far, and I'm, I'm excited to keep going with it. So... What do we have for the topic today? Well, I haven't come up with like a a cool name for it yet. Um, But basically, I want to talk about the public not not pulling over for emergency vehicles or, or, you know, the, the headache and the stress that comes with that, right? Like we as first responders get so frustrated with that, right? And I think it's something I want to address because I have a few thoughts about it. <laughs> so before I get into that, I kind of want to get into some housekeeping here first. Housekeeping. This like makes it sound like I'm a maid or I'm like really good housewife that's like always doing the dishes and sweeping up. But no, I'm sorry. I'm good at I mean, I will do it. Don't get me wrong. I'm not great at it. <laughs> Chris will probably tell you that, um, you know, but Wow, that sounds terrible. I don't know. I feel like I'm on a, I don't know. I, I don't know how I am today. I'm good today. It's good overall. It's been a bit stressful lately. Um, it's been, it's been a bit busy this month of February, you know, end of January, the entire February, but it's, it's starting to calm down and I'm happy because it's just, I needed a little bit of a break. <laughs> there were so many fire conferences and other personal things I had going on in the month of February. It was crazy how busy it was. And it's usually not bad. It's usually pretty, pretty relaxed. Um, so it's just different for me to get used to this year with all my commitments happening in February, but I'm going to get into the recent trainings and maybe some upcoming trainings or whatnot in a future episode. I I don't know what it's going to come out. Um, when, when I'll be talking about that, where I'm going to put it in at, but that'll be in a future episode. I'll recap all the trainings I just went to. I learned so much. I had such a fun time talking with people people I look up to, people who listen to the podcast, um, just other friends that I have in the fire service. And and it, it was, it's been a great month. It's been busy, but it's been great. So that recap will be coming at some point in the future. Um, let's see, another thing. Oh, yes. So uh, for those of you who are wondering about the YouTube page, it is up, running, functional, <laughs> and it is 100% up to date as of this moment. So... Hooray. <laughs> That's awesome. It, it took me a little bit longer than I expected to get the the episodes up there. It took me about two weeks to kind of get everything figured out, but a little bit of a learning curve, but they're all up there now. So if you guys want to catch this podcast on YouTube, it is now available there. Otherwise, you already know this is, you're listening to this wherever you get your podcasts. So if you want this podcast to be on a different platform that you can't find it on, let me know so I can add it there for you or for your friend or whoever it is that's asking about it. So let me know and I will do what I can to get it up on that platform for you. Um, with the YouTube page, I did say before that I'm going to be um, cutting down some of the guest episodes into just the family firefighter section. So that way we have a whole playlist of just those and that will be coming. It's not happening yet. And who knows with that, I, with the, the YouTube page in general, I may have fun just doing some more video stuff. I don't know yet. I, like I said in a two weeks ago, I'm not putting any expectation on this, on the YouTube page for certain things to be up there other than just the podcast episodes, because I want it to grow organically and where I don't know where life in this journey takes me. So stay tuned to see what's coming to that platform. The last thing I want to talk about before we get onto the subject for the episode, I, I want to bring up something that I, I saw on Facebook and it was so freaking cool. It was so cool. So Oklahoma City Fire Department, um, I, I don't know exactly how I saw this post of theirs because I wasn't following them at the time. So it must have just been from a friend of a friend or something, someone that liked it or shared it. I don't know. But I saw this post 
And they were talking about how they have a bunch of ladies who are in training, and um, at this point it'd be last week, right, uh, for the Oklahoma City Fire Department Family Support Division. And I saw this post, and I started freaking out in the in the best way possible. Because they get it. Oklahoma City gets it. <laughs> a lot of other departments out there get it too, but Oklahoma City really gets it. They see the need for a family-centered department. Not necessarily centered. They, they see the need for just family support, right? It is, <laughs> it is just so refreshing to see a department go all out for its members. And they don't have to. There, I don't, I don't believe so anyways. I don't think there's anything specifically saying that they had to do this, but they went for it. And I, I, that's what I want to see across the entire fire service. Career volunteer, it does not matter. I want to see that everywhere. I want to see, it doesn't have to be ladies. I just want to see a bunch of people on these teams, on these support teams who are able to go out there and to help families with with the craziness of it all, with helping them understand, maybe doing more group activities. Maybe, I don't don't know what is all entailed in this group or what will be entailed in this group, but just by seeing their announcement of it, it's going to be great. And by seeing some of the people who, who attended this training as part of it and knowing their passion for it, I'm excited. Like, this is a turning point for the fire service. And maybe this happens other places. Maybe this has been done at another major fire department. I don't know. I don't know. I don't, I don't know everything. I wish I did. That'd be, that'd be really nice to, like, have an ear and everywhere and just know that they got the idea from somebody else, right? But even so, this point in fire service history is a turning point. When when these kinds of issues are being brought to the forefront and something is being done about it. You know, whether you like it or not, career or volunteer, this is a family endeavor. Our families deal with our shift time, mandatory overtime, leaving when the page drops, unattended holidays and birthdays, the weight the job has on us, and the stress that keeps building and building with it all. You can't deny that as much as we love the job, it's tough. And, and family support in this is key. I don't know. It, it's, it's amazing. Just, I, I can't put it into any, any more words than that. I'm so excited to see where this is going to go, to see where, where they take it and, and how it's going to affect the rest of the fire service and other, other departments across even the world. So thank you. I mean, if somebody out there who happens to be on the support team or on a, Oklahoma City or or nearby or whatever. Thank you so much. Thank you for doing this. And if you have your own support division on, on your own department somewhere else, thank you for doing this because this is what we need to see. <sighs> okay. <laughs> Sorry, it's just like it was so cool. I just I just had to share it with you guys because I don't know how many people out there follow stuff like that. So um yeah, that's that's all I have for that for right now. That's so that that wraps up housekeeping for the day. Um, what we're we're getting yeah, close ish to ten minutes in. Okay, so let's let's go on with the actual episode. And I'm hoping by the time this comes out, I have figured out a a good title for this because if you couldn't catch in the very beginning, I didn't quite have a great title for it or a way to explain it to you guys. Okay, so what got me thinking about this? Um, well, here lately, the the video resurfaced. I think it's resurfaced. I don't think it's new. I don't know for sure. I think it resurfaced, though. I think it was already out. Um, Fire Department Chronicles put out a video about, you know, just the, 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 the dream of, like, you know, people pulling over for emergency vehicles and then the reality of it, right? Like how terrible it is and stuff. And it's hilarious. It is so funny and so true. So true. They do such a good job with that. But I I don't know. It got me thinking about it. It, and it, 
I've been wanting to do this episode for a little while now, and that's what really pushed me to do it. On top of that, I've heard here recently, even right before that video came out, or resurfaced or whatever, I've, I've heard so many people complain about it, complain about people not moving over, complain about just people being stupid and everyone goes done when the sirens go off and they don't understand why. It's not that hard. Pull over, let us get by, stop, whatever, right? It's not that hard. Why do they have a problem with it? And it started bugging me because we're firefighters. We like to complain. Don't deny it. You know it's true. <laughs> we all know it's true. We like to complain. But we complain and we don't ever figure out solutions. We don't ever figure out, well, why? Why do people have such a hard time with it? So, okay. So in the last, what, I'm 30 right now. <laughs> so I've had my driver's license or permit or whatever since I was 15 years old. So 15 years I've been driving. 15 years. I have only, as... As part of the public, I've only been around emergency vehicles when I was driving a total of three times. In 15 years, a total of three times has a an engine or a truck or police vehicle or ambulance, whatever, come around me or behind me or whatever, and I had to stop or pull over or something to let them by. Three times. That's not very much. It's approximately once every five years. And actually, two of those happened within the last month. So literally, one happened. One happened when I first got my permit back when I was 15. You might have been. I think it was 16 because I was picking up my little brother from school. So I was driving alone. So 16, my the first one happened. The next two didn't happen until I was 30 years old. That's a 15-year gap. And yes, I know I lived in a small town for a while. Okay. Fine, whatever. But that doesn't mean I didn't go to bigger cities or other places and drive around, too, during that time. And part of that time, you know, I was actually growing up in a decently sized town, okay? I think around, what, 15,000 people? So, like, not big, but not super tiny, either. There were emer emergency vehicles and stuff around. It, it should have happened. It could have happened. But it didn't. It was never the right time. It, it doesn't happen. So, <laughs> going back to the ones that happened, the two of them that happened in the last month. Let's talk about the scenario one, the first one that happened. I was actually attending a training with Chris in another, in another town. And we were coming back. And we were still in that town, and I was stopped at a stoplight. Awesome. The light had just turned green for me to go, and I was, I was the first vehicle. And I heard, heard the fire engine come up behind me. Okay, so they're coming. I'm good. I'm calm. Very level-headed. No big deal. Just a fire engine. Whatever. So instinctually, I... Instinctually? Instinctually? Instinctually. I shouldn't... I don't know how to pronounce that. <laughs> Using my instincts. There we go. Using my instincts, I looked to my left to see if they had room to get around me. Because I was in the left-hand lane. And I was stopped and there was a car in the right-hand lane. So it's not like I could move over right. So, out of instinct, I looked to the left, made sure they can get by, get by me in the turn lane if they needed to come straight. Awesome. If they couldn't have done that, if somebody was there, basically my choice at that point was to pull into the intersection for them to be able to get around me. Because there was nowhere else on the street that they could get by if that left turn lane was full. And they were in my lane coming up behind me. So... Luckily, I didn't have to go out into the intersection or anything. There was a there was room behind me in the left lane, and they were able to get around me that way. But what would they have said? What what would they have been thinking if I pulled into the intersection to let them get around me, or if I had just gone straight into the other other side of the road, right, gone across the intersection and stayed there? I don't know. You talk to different drivers; they want different things. <laughs> but to me, I just you know. Did that thing, made sure they'd get around me, awesome. So I stayed put. I didn't move. I figured the driver was smart enough to get around me that way and everything would be fine. And it worked out fine. No big deal. Awesome. Easy peasy. Scenario number two. I was on the highway and it, it was a very, very curvy highway at this point. And I was driving home. Chris and I were driving separately. So he was actually behind me a few cars. 
right? Not, not that far, but I could still see him in my rearview mirror back there. So I was looking back every once in a while just to make sure he was still there and whatnot, right? Um, while we're heading on our way home. And, and this sounds stupid to say out of nowhere, but it was literally out of nowhere. I did not see this vehicle beforehand. I did not see any lights. I did not hear any sirens. Nothing. And this vehicle was not there in these cars in between my husband and I. And I, I look back every once in a while, like, that's just me. Like, I look back, especially at this time, I know I looked back within, like, 10, 15 seconds. So that wasn't the problem here. But before I knew it, I looked in my rearview mirror, and there was a pickup truck with its lights on, literally right behind me, right on my bumper. And I was in the passing lane, I was passing a car. Did not see it. Did not see the lights. It was daytime, so it wasn't, like, super contrasting or anything against, against the sky or anything. And I didn't hear it. I didn't hear it until it passed me. I did not hear the sirens. Right? It completely surprised me, the whole thing. So at that point, I had two choices. I could either speed up and try to pass this vehicle faster to to let the car behind me go, you know, which... You know, at that point, especially as a public, you're thinking, is it okay to speed in this case, <laughs> you know, or not to get past this other car? So that way, whoever's with the lights and sirens behind me can get past me. Or do I slow down so I can move over to the right lane behind the car I was passing and let this car go by me? Well, with as close as he was to my bumper, I'm speeding and going up so I can, you know, get past this other car so he can then go by me. But I knew the priorities in that moment. I knew whoever was behind me with those lights on and stuff like that, if they weren't pulling me over, that was another little scare. I'm like, did, did I do something wrong? Am I getting pulled over? I have no idea what's going on. I took the gamble and assumed that they were going to something else. And so I sped up, went around this car and let him go past me and he did. But I'm someone who goes through that mindset and thinks through those possibilities. I am a first responder. The public, they don't, they don't have that training. They don't know. They don't know what we want. They have no idea. So, so those are the two scenarios that I recently went through. Nothing crazy, nothing life-changing, whatever. Okay. So let's look back to the public now. Before I was a firefighter, before I understood what the typical first responder would want them to do, I wouldn't know what to do. I wouldn't know to look over to the left lane to make sure the the fire engine could get by me. I wouldn't know that it's better to speed up and get past this car rather than to slow down and get behind this car to let the other one pass me. I probably would have froze. I I, I don't know. I don't know what I would have done. Because I didn't have that training. The public gets confused. They get almost a version of tunnel vision or something when they're driving and they see lights or hear sirens. And it, it's hard to remember. If you can remember back to before you were a first responder, it probably happened to you too. Probably. Not always, right? But probably. The public only sees those things. They're only around that stuff when something bad is happening. Okay, they're getting pulled over. Maybe somebody they know is in danger. Maybe, um, you know, maybe their house is on fire and you're coming to help them or whatever it is. Whatever it is, when they see and hear that, all they recognize is an emergency. And their brain starts freaking out because that's what they've been conditioned to do. It's an emergency. They don't know how to deal with it. What do they do in an emergency? They call us, <laughs> right? We come and fix their problem. <laughs> the brain spirals into a chaotic state, subconsciously remembering the bad things they witnessed when they've heard those sirens before. They don't know they're doing it. They don't know they're doing it. It just happens. And just like we as firefighters do, they become dumber when they're stressed. 
you've heard me talk about before the stress inoculation training. I think so. I'm pretty sure you have. Um, might have been a while ago, but we as firefighters and first responders, we train on that kind of stuff. We put ourselves in stressful situations during training. We, we raise our heart rates. We, we do all this stuff to make sure that when we come up on these crazy things or whatever, we stay calm and we remember our training. But we only are able to do that because we put ourselves in these stressful situations. You can't, and maybe there's somebody out there who is going to prove me wrong on this, <laughs> but from as much as I've done myself, seen myself firsthand, and heard and read about from plenty of fire service professionals out there, you cannot simply train on something with zero stress added, have it down perfect, be able to go into a stressful situation and do that same thing perfect. It will not be perfect if you have not trained under that stress level or something similar to it. That is why so many fire training companies out there put, <laughs> put so much stress on stress inoculation training. I know that sounds funny, but that's why they care about it so much. Because they know that's what you need to do to be able to do our jobs correctly, right? Okay, so we get that. We get that. So why do we expect the public when they are put out of nowhere under stress, right? Because it is, it is stressful hearing those lights, hearing those lights, <laughs> seeing those lights and hearing those sirens. It's stressful for them. That is their version of it. That is their version of us, I don't know, fighting for our lives and things, right? That is their version of it. Why do we expect them to be able to do it perfectly when they've never gone through the stress inoculation training with that? <sighs> and not just, you know, we, we see these lights and sirens every day. Even if you're a volunteer, you, you see them a lot. You, you go to plenty of calls, plenty of, you know, maybe it's just help me, I can't get up. Maybe it's, um, you know, tiny little grass fire stuff. Maybe it's um, smoke alarms or, or false alarms that you tend to go to. You're, you're in the rig. You are going to whatever you're going to. And your lights are on, your sirens are on. And you're fine, you're calm, you're relaxed. Because to that, those don't, those signals don't drive your brain into that stress-induced state. Because you're used to it. Basically, we've almost become numb to the effects of those. It's not that we don't hear them. We still hear them. But the effect doesn't, it doesn't hit us as bad. It's kind of like um, if you're new at a, at a depart department and your pager or the, the tones drop, right, for a call. If you're a probie, <laughs> that is awesome. And you're like freaking out about it and your heart rate goes up and you're like, ah, and like, it's so much fun and and it just it, it brings up your stress level a little bit and and you're excited to go to work and you're nervous and you're everything you're everything at that point you've been doing this for 20 30 years it stops happening it's just another call it's just another day yeah you may have a few calls that still raise it right but but most calls you're just like ah oh, it's fine it's not that big of a deal like we're good same thing. You finally got used to it. <laughs> and another thing to add on, not just the stress training. Let's talk about really, really briefly, the way vehicles are made <laughs> today. And my car isn't new. It's like 2012 or something. Not new, but not super old either. I could not hear those sirens in my car. I could barely hear them with the fire engine going, and those are good sirens. And I could not hear them at all with that pickup truck with the lights on. At all. Until it was passing me. We were also going at like 65, 70 miles an hour too. So like, you know, but okay. That's going to be a situation you guys might come up on. And if it's during the daytime and you don't have those lights piercing through the blackness of everything, and it's just in the daytime, it's not going to necessarily catch a driver's attention. It's not their fault. It's a little bit their fault, but not really their fault that they don't see you or they don't hear you. The, the cars are built against that nowadays. 
Especially, okay, imagine you have music up and playing. Because that may be part of the problem, too, because I totally did. I love blasting the music in my car. It's so much fun. So much fun. I, I, I love singing to it. But let's say, you know, like, somebody has that. They're not necessarily going to hear you, especially that plus the soundproofing. Oh, my goodness. And, like, if you're not looking in your rearview mirror every two seconds to see if something's back there, you're not expecting fire engines or, or police vehicles or ambulances. You're not expecting that to come up on you all the time. Because it doesn't, it doesn't happen that often, honestly. So if you're checking your rear view mirrors about once every 30 seconds or so, that's still tons of time. You could be sitting back there waiting for them to move. And they have no idea you're back there. No idea you're back there. And I understand why you complain. Because I've done it too. But it's not always their fault. <laughs> okay, so... So why do we expect the public to know what to do? Getting back onto that little track of things. Why do we expect the public to know what to do? And you're probably thinking, well, it's easy. It should be easy. We've told them from day one, from when they get their license and everything, pull over for emergency vehicles. Okay, I get it. But what does that mean to the drivers? And this is not a dig in the drivers. Every driver wants something different. Some drivers want everyone to be in the right-hand lane. Some drivers want people to be all the way on the side of the street. Some drivers aren't. I mean, like, like I said, when it came to that, that scenario number two, when I could either go faster or slower to get by that vehicle, what would you want me to do if you were the driver? I bet some of you are going to say, well, yeah, speed up faster. And some of you are going to say, go a little bit slower and get, you know, to get over. If you're stopped at an intersection and there's no way for the rig to get around you, let's say that hole in the scenario one, let's say that whole intersection was full and everything, where do I go? Where would you want me to go? I'm pretty sure the different people listening to this podcast are going to say different things. They're going to, one's going to tell me to, you know, somehow go to the other side of the street and get in the right hand lane. Someone's going to tell me to turn right. Somebody's going to tell me just to go into the middle of the intersection and wait until the truck passes. You're going to tell me different things. So why do you expect me to know what to do? The public doesn't go through first responder training. Obviously. <laughs> Obviously. They don't go through first responder training. They don't go through... I don't know. They, they don't know what we want. They can't read our minds because they've never gone through it before. I am not going to do something right for an electrician who wants me to help them out with something. Okay, that's probably a little bit far. But, like, I'm not going to land an airplane. I've never done it before. So why would you, as an airplane pilot, expect me to know how to do that? Okay, that's not a good example. But you know what I mean. It's not their job. It's not their job to know. They've never done this stuff before. They're not thinking of what the rig is going to need, and they're not thinking about putting the firefighter's needs first. They weren't trained for that like we are. They don't know what you want. I mean, it comes also down to the whole fight, flight, or freeze response. It used to be fight or flight, and then they added freeze at some point. I don't know, but you know what? Freeze totally makes sense. Think of this. If people don't move out of the way for you when you're coming down the street, what do they tend to do? They just stop right in the middle of the road, kind of create a roadblock, and you're screwed. Right? I've heard of plenty of fire departments out there that if they're on a way to a call, and it's not super urgent, or if they're... Um, so like if they're like second or third due or something for it, or if, um, they're on the way from the, the call to the hospital or something like that, they don't run their lights because that confuses the public more because it actually slows down traffic. Isn't that funny? It's kind of funny. It's kind of funny, but they did the research and there are plenty of departments out there that do that. Like I said, at least a lot of them, when it, when it comes from the, between the 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 call and the and the hospital a lot of them 
a lot of ones out there do that. They, they don't put on any sort of lights or sirens because of that reason. Because they found people stop. People get stupid when they see sirens. They don't know what to do. <laughs> uh. The public doesn't think about what you're going to do in a fire truck. Fire rig. Rig. Not even fire. Just whatever you're driving. Vehicle. Emergency vehicle. That's probably the better used word to use. Uh, but they, they don't think about it. So let's say a fire truck is going around in traffic, right? They're going to use the left turning lane to get by whoever's there. Okay, well, are they going to take it and go straight like I allowed them to do in scenario one? Or are they going to do it to turn left? I mean, obviously, they're going to utilize what they need, right, to go whichever way they need to go. But what if, as a person in the public, I saw them in the left turning lane and maybe they were just using it to get extra room to go around somebody. And they go straight, and I didn't know they would go straight, and I end up running into them. Stupider things have happened. Stuff, I'm sure scenarios like that happen all the time. Because the public doesn't think about it. They see you in the left turning lane. They're in their own own path, own brain. They've, they've been driving for forever. They know how to drive, so they're going to follow the rules of traffic. Where... Emergency vehicles are relaxed on some of those rules when it comes to things like that, you know, as needed, safely, <laughs> I should add. But they're used to their normal, and that's not normal. Accidents are more likely to happen. You know, let's talk about rigs turning right. How often do you use the left lane to turn right? Big trucks, it happens. And if you're not occupying both of those lanes, if you're not in the middle, or if you're not on a tiller truck or whatever that can occupy both of those lanes, somebody from the public's not going to realize it. They're not going to know you want to go right. They're going to see you in the left lane. They're going to think the right lane's clear. It's okay. They're going to expect you to go straight, and you're going to turn right, and there's another accident waiting to happen. This is basically miscommunication, except for on a driving front. This is not, it, it, it should be talking communication. We'll get into that in a second. But this is communication through driving. And it's a miscommunication because they don't know what you're trying to tell them. They don't get it. Okay, yeah, you know what? Let's go into communication. Let's talk about that for a second. And this, I don't know, this might be the last segment of this. It's supposed to be, but you know me, it may keep going. <laughs> so, we need to communicate more with the public on what to do. Like I've been saying this whole time, it's not their fault. It is, but it isn't. It's not their fault that they turn dumb when we come up behind them. It's not their fault. They were never trained for this. So how do we fix it? How do we go about fixing it instead of just complaining about it all the time? Because complaining does nothing if you don't have a solution for it or if you're not trying to work towards a solution for it. It's our responsibility and it's our job to educate them on what we need them to do. It's, it's just another form of a public education, like the close before you doze, like clearing out the fire hydrants, um, you know, making sure that they stay out of the house, you know, not go back in. Um, making sure they don't hide in closets or, or under any sinks and stuff like that, you know, and help you out when you're going to search for them, right? It's another part of communication. We need to educate them on what to do and how to respond to a vehicle, to, to an emergency vehicle coming up on them. And it's tough. I know it's tough. You're like, what, when do we do this? How do we do this? How do we reach everybody? Well, first of all, you're not going to reach everybody. I, I know it sucks. You're not going to reach everybody, but you can try to reach as many people as you can. I honestly, I never went through a driver's ed class when I was growing up. I was taught by my parents. I did, um, you had to log so many hours of driving and prove that you went through, um, some stuff and then, um, then you went in for your driver's test and stuff like that, blah, blah, and you're good to go. Right? 
Um, that's what I did. I didn't go through driver's ed. So maybe this is already in there. I don't know. <laughs> but we need to talk about more scenarios with emergency vehicles when it comes to those driver's licenses. Not just pull over and get out of the way. Not just that. No, you need to actually go into specifics. It's like you telling me, hey, there's a house on fire. The only thing you need to know is to pull a line and go put the fire out. Great. That's basic. That, that is true. Every fire, that's what you should be doing, right? Every structure fire, you pull a line off and you go put the fire out. Awesome. Thank you for letting me know that. I will remember that for the rest of my fire career. Okay. Then what? What happens if I, there's a problem? What happens if something doesn't go according to plan? What if I can't go through the front door? What if, um, I don't know, what, what if I need a bigger line? What if someone tells me to do something differently? What if there's somebody screaming at the front door? What if there's somebody in the window? What do I do? All I've ever been taught was to get a line off the truck and go in and put the fire out. That's it. That is... Th that is the exact same thing. <laughs> All we tell them is pull over for emergency vehicles. Great. Then what? What happens when it doesn't go perfectly smooth? And it usually doesn't go perfectly smooth. There's almost always some sort of problem. So yeah, if we have something more on driver's ed, I, I'd love to see that. Again, I don't know for sure. Don't quote me on that. But... Go check it out. See if your driver's ed program or in your local area has a good section on emergency vehicles. It's important. You can talk to your public through Facebook, doing posts, doing Facebook lives, news, right? You have news channels, I'm sure. Some sort of nightly news that you're, you're that's in your area or available to your area. You know, you have your local newspapers, you have special events you can go set up at. You can create your own special event <laughs> for it. You know, you can have a booth at another event. You could, you can have a guest speaker at a school. That's easy to set up. <laughs> Team up with a business or an organization to expand your message. There's somebody out there who will partner with you if you ask them. Find, find a business or organization that fits to your values or your target market or whatever. Join with them, collaborate, and put out this big message to everywhere. Do stuff together. Do events together. Do uh, other PR things together. Make it a big thing. And when you're doing these, don't just go back to the age-old pull over for emergency vehicles. No. Go more detailed. Go more in-depth. The public can handle it. They can. And if nothing else, the least they're going to remember is going to be pull over for emergency vehicles, which at least that's something. <laughs> and the ones that understand more are going to get the full thing of it. They're going to understand more of what we want. But we have to put in the work. We have to make sure that we are doing our part in this situation to make it better. And this isn't saying just do one post, just do one event and everything's going to be fixed. It's not. This is a lifelong challenge. This will probably never be 100% fixed because they don't know what we're going through. They don't know what we expect. They, they're just not used to it in general. Their stress is going to kick in. It is. There's not much you can do to stop that. But when you do these, make sure you're not doing it just once. You have to do it multiple times. And it cannot just be you do it once for a couple weeks and then you're done for with it for another four years. No. You're going to have to, leave, have to constantly update it. And they keep seeing it over and over and over again. Yeah, do it a couple weeks. I'll, I'll write together in a row at the very beginning. That's great. Make a big campaign out of it, right? But keep reintroducing it every month, every other month, every three months, whatever it is. Don't go too long without saying a message about it. Because the longer you go in between those messages about it and however you spread that message, out of all those ideas I gave you, and hopefully more that came to your brain, 
the longer you wait in between, the more they're going to forget. And you don't want them to forget about it. So don't go too long. And when I talk about Facebook, I probably should just say all social media. If you're really wanting to hit the younger drivers of today, Facebook is not the place. That is not the place. Instagram is not even really the place anymore for that. Yes, Instagram's great. But it's not the place to catch the new drivers. You are going to be looking for them over on TikTok at least. There's probably a new one out by now that I don't know much about. But you're probably going to find them over on TikTok. Put together a cool video. Or just even a video. It doesn't have to be cool. I don't know. Try to make it cool so that they actually watch it, right? But just put together something that they can see and they understand. I never got into Snapchat. I'm assuming Snapchat's still a thing and pretty good. Pretty good hype and going. I don't know. I don't know. But whatever social media you can do and you can keep up with, that's important. You have to keep up with it. Find it. Spread that message that way. Facebook's good because it does, it does hit a lot of people. It does. There are a lot of ranges of ages on there just because there's a lot that happens on there. And that's great. Maybe your older community, I say older, <laughs> I'm 30 and I use Facebook mostly now still. So, um, <laughs> so if I say older, apparently that includes me as well. But, uh, so your older community, you know, it's still going to be on Facebook. So if you want to hit those drivers, obviously, yes, use Facebook. But if you want to hit the new up and coming drivers, you got to use what they're using now for social media. Or other ways you're going to hit them, like going to schools or other events and stuff. I don't know. This, it's such an interesting topic because I don't know if people think about things from the public's point of view. And I think it's because most of us have spent so much time being removed from that. Even if you're new into the fire service, new into first responding, your brain transitions very quickly, <laughs> at least mine did, very quickly into the way we operate. And it's sometimes hard, it's very much actually hard for most people to go back and think about what it was like from the public's point of view. I, I don't know why I do it a lot. Um, it seems like a lot of my, a lot of the topics I talk about on here tend to be from that other point of view. Um, and maybe it's just another thing. I love playing devil's advocate. I love talking about things from different sides because I want you to see that there's more to one side of every story. There's more to one side of every conflict. You know, two people can believe they're doing the right thing while the other one sees the other as evil. It's tough. It's tough to see it from both sides. But I hope this episode has given you a taste into that and seeing that yeah, you can still complain. It's going to happen, right? Like, And I'm probably still going to complain about it too or laugh about it or whatever it is. But be kind. Understand it's not their fault. And it's, it's, it's our responsibility. Career volunteer, I, I keep saying it, but it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what you are. It is still your responsibility to teach the public this. To help train them. <laughs> in this so that it makes our jobs easier and it keeps the roads safer. Let's be very honest. I think that's uh, going to be all for today. I don't have anything else on this topic that I can think of at the moment. I'll probably regret saying that. <laughs> and, and like, after I stop recording, I'm like, Oh, I should have had this in there. And you know what? Maybe I did. And you just don't know it. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. But, um, I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you learned something or th it made you think. That's the point of these episodes. I hope it made you think. If you like what you heard, please uh, go over to Apple Podcasts or over on my Facebook page, Couplings Fire Podcast, and uh, leave me a rating or review. Let me know what you thought about it. Um, doing that really helps show others who are finding podcasts, who are looking up Fire Podcasts. It shows them that this is one worth listening to. And that is... That is my goal, to give you a podcast that is worth listening to, that makes you think, and that, I don't know, betters us as a whole, as a fire service, as people, right? Each episode has its own own goal in mind on what it helps us to better or what it, what is it, it is intended to do. This one's to get you to think. This one is to get you to see things from another side. And I, I hope you enjoy that. Um, I thank you so much for being here and listening to this today. Uh, next week, uh, I will be a good one. 
I, I thoroughly enjoyed recording it. Uh, I'm going to have Jeremy Sanders with Crew First Culture on next week's podcast. And, and you know what? I don't have a name for that one either. That, it was such a good conversation and we, it goes everywhere and we got, we got very deep with it. And a lot of it is spent on that family firefighter survival side. And, and I don't, I don't know. It was, it was just such a deep episode and I loved recording it and we got into things that are, that are hard to talk about. And I think that's, that's good. So if you're ready for, for a nice, deep, good, good conversation, tune in next week uh, for that episode coming out on Friday next week. As always, episodes come out on Friday. <laughs> um, but yeah, look forward to that. And that should be it. So everybody have a good night, day, whatever time you're listening to this. And I will catch you on the next episode. See ya. Thanks for coming by and listening to the podcast. I hope you enjoyed it. Be sure to leave a rating and a review wherever you're listening. Follow me on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube at Coupling Spire Podcast. See you next time, everybody.